Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Carly P. Riley Show. On today's episode, we are talking about one of the most popular podcasters in the world and the New York Magazine cover story that purports to unveil a pattern of pathological lying. We'll talk about if we think they succeed at that or not, but I'm interested in this story because it, it gets deep into internet culture and sort of science and technology and media culture. And because primarily I, I feel like everyone is talking about this story differently than how I would like to see it talked about, which is that this article in New York Magazine is is fairly messed up. And the fact that this is a cover story for New York Magazine is 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 embarrassing a bit for New York Magazine. On the other hand, Andrew Huberman seems like he's pretty messed up. And I think there are things that are uncovered in this story that are valid things to be concerned about when you're talking about one of the most popular podcasters in the world who has become a role model to millions of men. And I feel like the, the camp of people who take that approach seem to accept the article wholesale and are like, yeah, see, go get them. And then the people who are critical of the article are minimizing what I do see as the one very important and valid attack or criticism that comes out of this article. <clears throat> now, in case you missed this, Andrew Huberman, as I said, one of the most popular podcasters in the world. He has the Huberman Labs podcast, which is really the next iteration of the self-optimization movement. If you were ever into people like Tim Ferriss, who I love and who I've actually interviewed before, Tim Ferriss was that early example. He did a lot of self-experimentation to help demonstrate how to live your best life, what supplements to take and neurotropics and cold plunges. And it's very much that world. But where Tim Ferriss was very, again, self-experimenting, Huberman brings a more credentialed scientific approach to things. Huberman is a, a professor at Stanford, tenured. He's a researcher, a scientist. He has a lab at Stanford, the Huberman Labs, though that gets called into question in this piece, but I think it's kind of stupid, so we're gonna talk about that. But this New York Magazine article. So the article, it bounces between a criticism of Huberman that is somewhat more on the professional side. It's criticizing him professionally a bit more. And then it bounces between that and, and a narrative primarily told by this woman, Sarah, who is an ex-girlfriend of Huberman's. She dated him for five, six years, something like that. Dated him for a long time. And uh, she obviously had a a pretty negative experience, all told, dating Andrew Huberman. Okay, let's talk about some of what is patently, in my opinion, bullshit about this story. First and foremost, I mentioned this woman, Sarah. She is the protagonist of this piece. And this article quotes friends of hers who describe their feelings about Andrew that are just have no place, have do not belong in newsprint. And by the way, these friends are anonymous. Sarah is anonymous. Like we don't actually know specifically who these people are. So one friend said she didn't really like Andrew because she always found him sort of anxious and jittery. And, and but specifically like he, she felt he was over attentive to his dog in a way that she found weird. The idea being he was always fretting over, does he have a blanket? Is he warm enough? Does he need to take, take the blanket off? I mean, sure. That sounds like something you may find annoying in your friend's boyfriend. It strikes me as a completely irrelevant thing to ever put in any sort of news print. If you were to ask my friends their opinions on any number of my ex-boyfriends, I wouldn't even see that as legitimate to put in in an article. Like, sure, my friends are going to have criticisms of the men who have hurt me in the past. And that's sort of how the world works. And it does not mean that you should write it up and put it in New York Magazine. But that one wasn't even the worst one. The worst one to me was a friend of Sarah's was describing how she felt, I guess, that Sarah had changed over the course of being in this relationship with Andrew. And so apparently, at one point while dating Andrew, Sarah had said to this friend, who again is anonymous in the piece, Sarah is too, Sarah's not her real name, but Sarah said to the friend, quote, I just want to be with my kids and cook for my man. And the friend's reaction to that, now this is the friend to whom Sarah said that, speaking to the reporter about that quote. The friend said, I was like, who says that? I mean, I've known her for 30 years. She's a powerful, decisive, strong woman. We grew up in this very feminist community. That's not a thing either of us would ever say. To which my feeling is like, apparently it's something she would say because it's something she said, according to you, you said she said that. And I understand the picture that's trying to be painted here, I guess, is that Andrew was emotionally manipulated 
manipulative such that Sarah became this different person. And, and that can certainly happen in relationships. But overall, that, that was not really the central criticism. It, it's very weird. Andrew did not have a gun to this woman's head asking her to make him meals or telling her that that's what she needed to love from now on. But my bigger issue, honestly, with this whole quote is that it plays into a trope that says feminism is women wanting singularly to be girl bosses and that wanting to make dinner for your husband and care for your kids is somehow inherently not feminist. And I almost hate that I have to repeat this because I feel like it, it's such a trope to even have to say this, but feminism is about choice. It's that 80 years ago, I had to want to make dinner for my husband and raise kids. And that had to be the, the place I got joy from. And I was considered a bad woman if that wasn't what I wanted. And I didn't really have choices beyond that. And now I can choose that if I so choose, or I can choose not to do that. And so those were the kinds of, on multiple levels, strange anecdotes that were clearly trying to fit a bigger narrative of Huberman as this bad, toxic man, but that I don't think really served that purpose particularly well and actually made the whole piece feel more like the kind of junk journalism that this author is arguing Huberman participates in on the junk science side. <clears throat> in addition to some of the personal life things that come up, this article, this author also tried to call into question Huberman's credentialing. The author here seems to be trying to argue that Huberman does not really have a lab. And her proof for this is one anonymous research researcher at Stanford. The picture she is trying to paint here is that Huberman has somehow misled the public about this lab. But what seems pretty obvious, even from reading this piece that is working hard to try and get you pissed off, is that Huberman has spent his career as an academic and a scientist. He had a lab at Stanford. It still exists. It's been significantly pared back since it's heyday, I suppose, that he it maybe was starting to scale down prior to COVID, which interestingly enough corresponds with, coincides with the time that Huberman was really starting to build up his podcast. And none of that strikes me as particularly delegitimizing for Andrew Huberman. So that gives you a sense, if you have not read this very long article, that gives you a sense of the pieces of this that just feel irresponsible journalistically. But let's talk about what I think other critics of the piece are missing because the core allegation here, and to be fair, we don't get to this core allegation until quite late in the article. But the core allegation is not simply that Andrew Huberman, a 48 year old unmarried man with wealth and power and now fame is sleeping with multiple women. That would not be revelatory. It wouldn't be anything, right? And there are people who are treating this article, in my opinion, like that is the revelation here. This article isn't even that Andrew Huberman is a cheater and has slept with many women or dated somebody and then would go off and sleep with hookers or, or whatever. The accusation here is that Andrew Huberman was in multiple serious long-term relationships, years long relationships with potentially five, six or more women at a time, one of whom he was living with and undergoing F IVF treatments with in service of freezing embryos with this woman. He was trying to have babies with this woman, though I say it like that because in a very weird moment for this article, though for once it wasn't because the author was being weird, it's because Huberman seemed to do something weird. A Huberman spokesperson chimed in on this article in a number of moments, but in this particular moment and said that Huberman denies that he and Sarah had decided to have children together, clarifying that they, quote, decided to create embryos by IVF. What? Okay, I'm sorry. We're, we're not trying to have children. I'm just trying to fertilize her eggs and store them for years to come. It's such a weird, what is the point of that clarification? None of that makes the relationship you had with her seem any less serious. So he is fertilizing a woman's eggs, living with this woman, and simultaneously he is talking to five, six other women, uh, many quite seriously. One woman he is he's also talking to about having children with her. And this strikes me as, frankly, somewhat sociopathic behavior. I know I'm not a clinician. We're not supposed to armchair psychologist people, but I've had a friend who was in this exact situation. She was dating a man through COVID for like 10 months, thought they were very serious or were getting serious, starting to get serious, and ultimately found out that he was, he had been seriously dating multiple other women for years. And if you've had the experience of having a friend go through that, your advice to your friend is like, that person's a sociopath. That is so crazy. And this story with Andrew, this allegation is that 
a lot of this happened through COVID, which feels especially violating because COVID was a time when many people were obviously trying to be safe about who they were spending time with so that they weren't exposed to more than they thought they were going to be exposed to. People were seeing parents, perhaps, things where they just wanted to be careful about their own health. And you have somebody who is lying to you, who you think you are monogamous with, who is not only just going out and seeing more people than they are telling you, sleeping with people. And this brings me to what I think is the most damning allegation in the piece, which is that one woman here says that while believing she was monogamous with Andrew, I think Sarah is the one who said this, she, I guess, contracted HPV. The way it was written was a, it was a little bit unclear, but seemingly contracted HPV. So ultimately, five or six of these women have now connected and are in a group chat together. Through this connection, they have put together a timeline showing some pretty nefarious things in my in my view. So here's a quote from the article. The women compared time stamped screenshots of texts and assembled therein an extraordinary record of deception. There was a day in Texas when after Sarah left his hotel, Andrew slept with Mary and texted Eve. They found days in which he would text nearly identical pictures of himself to two of them at the same time. They realized that the day before he had moved in with Sarah in Berkeley, he had slept with Mary and he had also been with her in December 2023, the weekend before Sarah caught him on the couch with a sixth woman. They realized that on March 21st, 2021, a day of admittedly impressive logistical jujitsu, while Sarah was in Berkeley, Andrew had flown Mary from Texas to LA to stay with him in Topanga. While Mary was there visiting from thousands of miles away, he left her with his dog to go to a coffee shop where he met Eve. And they had a serious talk about their relationship. They thought they were in a good place and he wanted to make it work. So he has flown a woman from Texas to LA to stay with him in his house. This is a woman, by the way, Mary, who had, he'd been dating or seeing for years, by the way. He leaves her to go to a coffee shop to talk to another woman about the state of their relationship, which is that they were good. And then he texts Mary, the woman staying at his house. Phone died. He's saying his phone died, which seems to be a lie because of course he was just hanging out with Eve. Then while he's back at his house with this woman, Mary, he later then texts Eve, thank you for being so next, next level gorgeous and sexy. Apparently on the same day, he also texted Sarah, the woman that he ultimately moved in with, sleep well, beautiful. So again, cue the memes about how his optimization lifestyle clearly works because he has managed to maintain a crazy schedule of, of serious relationships with many women. Now, the last thing I want to highlight here that I found distressing is that the language he would use with these women was actually very reassuring, very lovely. When Sarah did discover that he had cheated on her the, fir the first time she discovered that, he texted her, I hear you are saying you are angry and hurt. I will hear you as much as long as needed for us. As a woman, if you got a text like that, I think you'd feel really reassured. You'd feel like, okay, this is somebody who understands why I'm upset and who's willing to take as long as it'll take, is, is what I hear him saying there, for us to work and work through this. He texted Eve at one point, your feelings matter. I'm actually very much a caretaker. By the way, he texted her that while he was on a camping trip with Sarah and he was injecting her with IVF treatment. That is what freaks me out the most because oftentimes when guys are cheaters or guys are bad partners, it is also reflected in their communication style, which is that they are gaslighters. That term maybe gets overused, but they clearly make you feel like you're the crazy one. They don't communicate well. They, you know, they, they do things that are clearly red flags. This is not obvious. This is somebody who is leveraging therapy speak, who very much has clearly knows how to, to, to make women feel more comfortable and say all the right things. So the fact that he is doing this, and then for years, again, this wasn't like a three month period, for years doing this to women while he's apologizing, pretending like he knows what he did was wrong and then making, seemingly making no change to the behavior. It feels very sociopathic to me. And, and this matters because you are talking about a man who is for hours a week in the ears of millions of other men. Now, I was surprised to see that Reddit seemed to actually largely agree on this. This person said, to all the people who are fine with this, it's not about the fact that he's sleeping around. Good for him, go for it, King. It's the fact that he had to lie and lie a lot. It's incredibly manipulative. If he wanted a bunch of fuck buddies, he could have found just that and been honest about it. 
It's not being a slut that's immoral. It's the damn lying and cheating. Totally agree with that. Final one here that I think is interesting. I think the biggest issue here is the lying part. His entire podcast is predicated on him providing people with information that is as close to the truth as he can, except that he's apparently a pathological liar and a psychopath who manipulates people emotionally and psychologically to feel superior and to get his rocks off. I mean, I didn't say that. And I don't know if that's true. I do believe that there are two sides to a story and I, the journalist has proven herself to to not be fair or unbiased in the reporting of this. So I, I'm open to the other side here, but on the surface, from what we can see in these text messages, it, it's really messed up. All right, folks, would love to know what you think. Please comment below. If you like this episode, subscribe, like, comment. I guess I already said that and I will see you next time.